Since the beginnings of motorsport, the Isle of Man has been the gathering place of motorcyclists of the world. In this sporting age of concern for safety and sophistication, the TT races are a declining influence, but the disciples of road racing have hardly noticed. The wheel was a prominent symbol on the Isle of Man long before the TT, when the lead mines were the island's test of endurance for man and machine. Even the national emblem implies circular motion, and the motto that goes with the three legs of man means, it will stand wherever you throw it. It's an expression that is especially poignant when related to the TT races. No other racing event can boast a setting more breathtaking, but the TT mountain course has a beauty that disguises a beastly statistic. One hundred and forty-one lives have been lost in eighty years of racing here, and the TT has had to ride out more than one attempt to destroy it. Through all, it has survived and developed. For 10 years now, the island has been spurned by the Grand Prix set, the high-earning professional. But the curb-clipping specialist and the amateur enthusiast still revere the place. If safety heads your list of priorities, you don't go near the island. If you're excited by risk and old-fashioned challenges, the TT offers plenty of both. And here, the march of technology accelerates rather than diminishes the degree of the challenge. Those who rise to it are fanatical, a point that has proven in the most dramatic of mishaps on the way to sporting glory. This is Strangford Loch, Northern Ireland, just across the Irish Sea from the Isle of Man. Every year, dozens of Northern Ireland's road racers and their machinery are ferried by fishing trawler from the harbours here to Peel or Port Erin, four hours' journey away. Two years ago, the Tornamona didn't make it. She was carrying the machinery of some of Northern Ireland's top riders. Also aboard, Joey Dunlop and his road racing brother. We were down uh, below in the cabin. Joey was cooking lamb chops or something. And uh, I think I just had a bite of one whenever the boat hit the, the rocks and the pan went flying. <laughs> And the dishes and everything went flying. Just. We had a bit of an argument just before it because one wanted salt on it and the rest, someone didn't want salt. And someone said the rubber didn't get enough of salt on them now. <laughs> I think the worst bit was standing on the front of the boat watching the bikes all go down below the water. You know, it was... You could have just felt like greeting. You know, you can see thousands and thousands of pounds worth and weeks and weeks of work just singing below the water. To miss a TT never entered my mind. I just, I, I love the TT and I just, I it would take more than that to, to keep me from the TT. So, 12 months on, the expedition party assembles again for a renewed assault on the island. Racing commitments at home allow the riders to fit in with the infrequent visits of the Isle of Man steam packet to Belfast, so the trip to the island, at least, should be incident-free. Record entries have been received this year, 18% up on the previous best. Some classes are oversubscribed. Some riders won't get beyond qualifying. Ten years on from the loss of its World Championship Grand Prix status, 
the revival of the TT appears complete. The nadir was the mid-70s. The great Italian, Giacomo Agostini, who won nine times from 10 starts between this race in 1968 and 1972, then led a walkout by the top Continental Grand Prix stars. They were increasingly dissatisfied with both the safety standards and the money they were getting at the TT. Their boycott had far-reaching consequences. After the 1976 races, the Isle of Man was struck off the World Championship calendar. A steady decline into obscurity might have followed. Instead, the island's fight back was immediate. When they came to rest, the three legs of man were not in a tangle. They stood firm and resolute. This was only to be expected for the Manx people are as independent as any island community can be and fiercely protective of their traditions. Although one of the British Isles, the Isle of Man is not a part of the United Kingdom and is well used to going its own way. Its thousand-year-old parliament considers United Kingdom legislation but makes its own decision on whether to accept, amend or reject it. One of the more striking differences with the United Kingdom is the income tax rate, 20% across the board which, along with the absence of capital gains tax, wealth tax and estate duty, makes the place irresistible to the wealthy. Like racehorse owner Robert Sangster, who resides here at the nunnery. Racing driver Nigel Mansell, comedian Norman Wisdom and supermarket tyro Albert Goubet are others attracted here by the financial package which was put together 25 years ago to bolster a flagging island economy. When the TT, an important part of the tourist industry, looked doomed 10 years ago, a similar style recovery plan was hatched with the government playing an integral part. I don't think the Manx government has, have ever wavered from support of the TT and the large financial commitment uh, carries on year in, year out without serious question. A large amount of income is generated in the retail sector during the TT period, certainly, and this usually sets the tone for the whole season. So the government vastly increased its financial commitment to the races. Nearly a quarter of a million pounds went into the 1978 event, a boost that was immediately successful in luring Mike Halewood, the TT's greatest champion, out of retirement. For their part, the organisers, the Auto Cycle Union of Britain, created their own world championship, just for the Isle of Man. Known as formula racing, it emphasised production-based machinery. And of course, that opened the way for a new crop of champions for the road racing fans to look up to. One of the very few surviving events from the infant days of motorsport had been preserved. It had all begun in 1904, when Tinwald, Manx Parliament, agreed to close roads for speed events conducted by the Automobile Club of Great Britain. Westminster forbade such events on British roads. Amendments were readily added to the original Road Closure Act in the years that followed to safeguard what rapidly became one of the world's premier speed tests. Initially, the event was for cars. Motorcycles were added in 1907. The emphasis from the start was on long-distance trials designed to develop touring vehicles for the general public. That's where the TT came from, tourist trophy. Even now, the racing takes the form of a time trial. Riders set off in pairs at 10-second intervals, aiming for the fastest time over a 226-mile journey. Little, in fact, has changed over the last 80 years.
The 37-mile mountain course, first used in 1911, underwent some alterations in 1920 and remains the course they either love or loathe today. Some sections have been widened, others made smoother, but the true nature of the course remains untouched. A myriad of corners, seemingly similar touring speeds, but critically different at 130 miles an hour. Miles of straight road to tax the most modern of equipment to the limit. And everywhere, roadside hazards. Racing here demands the utmost discipline and respect from every rider, no matter how familiar he is with the course. Joey Dunlop is the current king of the roads. The challenge for the TT is always there, for, especially for me, because I prepare most of my own. And every year you go, something else goes wrong. You know, and you find out different things every year. You don't even set your bikes up till the same for the TT. You know, it's really hard to explain the... Uh, the like my Formula One or the 500, you're not setting them up for really top speed. You're setting them up so they're easy to ride and they hang really well. The suspension has to be a lot softer for the DT. But uh, if you take it to a short circuit, it would be no use because it's not grippable well enough. The, uh, there's no really around the TT8 you're really scratching the way you do in a short circuit. So you, you try and equalise between the short circuit and the road. You must be as comfortable as you can. You know, you have six laps at 37 and a quarter mile. It's not like an eight-lap race around the northwest or around a short circuit. The exhaust system's all changed, and uh, the carburetor's all changed. It leaves the fire a lot lower. It's not as piggy. You know, I have my Formula One maybe be cut down 10, 15 mile an hour from it be at the northwest. But it, uh, it's to leave it a lot easier to ride and a lot safer to ride. Now he's doing it on my own. Have you seen the you have to realize that the TT rider is talking a different language from you and I. The science of safe riding to him means top speeds of 180 miles an hour and average speeds over the duration of a race of 115 miles an hour. And he has a quite different concept of personal welfare. Broken bones, ruptured organs are all just a part of the trade. Bad experience last year because I crashed three times. Two times really badly. The last one was the hardest. I broke the angle and uh, the season was finished last year after the TT for me. But I'm perfectly okay now. <laughs> I like the, the feeling and all the area around the Isle of Man. And so I will come. I think as long as I'm on a race bike, I will go to the Isle of Man. The greatest worry that any TT rider has is not the circuit, but mechanical failure. And uh, three years ago, after 25 years of raiding here, never having an accident, unfortunately, I had that just happened to me at Balaf Bridge, and it gave me a very bad accident. But the unshakable enthusiasm of the road racer is built on calmly accepting the smooth, in Bill Smith's case, four TT wins with the very rough. I had uh, both legs very badly broken and the pelvis both my elbows and forearms broken and uh, back injuries and kidneys stopped working for a fair while, so I was pretty badly knocked about. What has brought me back? Same thing has brought me in the first place. I just like the Isle of Man. No amount of punishment short of death itself will turn the bitten shy. It is one year between and uh, I think I've I'm OK in the circuit and have no problems. I think most people who race in the Isle of Man, it's, it's, it's a labour of love. It's certainly not done from financial interest. It's something you like doing, and when it's deeply ingrained in you, it's hard to get it out of your system. The magnetic grip of the TT not only overpowers the competitors. Leonard and Mavis Newton from Nottinghamshire have been marshalling at the TT in the Manx Grand Prix for the last 30 years. Their daughter used to come with them, 
and their grandson, Joan Scott, is attending for the 16th year. There we are, everything you need in They're the given the powers of special police constables at their chosen marshalling point, Caramore. I'd always been interested in the sport. My father rode motorcycles before me, so as a family we came over and we started to go from there. I've only missed one practice in all that time, and that was, uh, I did overlay one morning, but uh, that is then, I think once in that length of time, I can justifiably be excused. Long before I ever came to the island, I used to listen to Graham Walker giving the commentaries on the TT races. I used to wish I was here. I've been coming since I was about uh, 18 months old, and uh, I've always watched from Kerrimore. We've covered the whole course at various points. Not every one, but we've been round the course at various vantage points, and we've finally settled at Kerrimore. It's a very quick corner, but it is dangerous. They come down from about 120 to 150 miles an hour. And some of them, they're, they're brushing the bank on the other side of the road, and the, the grass will never grow on it. <laughs> There's always something different to see in the way that the competitors take the corner. Unfortunately, some of them you know jolly well from the top of the hill as they're approaching the corner. They're going to have a jolly hard job to get round. Fortunately, most of them do. It's not uncommon for TT pilgrims to make one section of the track their annual vantage point to the exclusion of all others. For some, it even becomes their tomb. Osmond Samuel Scott's ashes are scattered at the bleak Keppel Gate. It's not the first time a New Zealand rider a number of years ago also requested the same thing and his wishes were granted. I had a call from Osmond's solicitors and uh, asking could it be arranged and I got in touch with the authorities and the Reverend Terry Isherwood and the undertakers and uh, it, it was carried out. Um, Osmond rode in the TT in six races between I think 52 and 56, finished in three, retired in three. Now, Why he chose this particular spot I, I don't honestly know. He could have retired here or maybe it was his favourite corner but he obviously loved the place. We were just very pleased that uh, we could ensure that his last wishes were carried out for a, a former rider. But where there's still life, there's a compelling commitment to the challenge, even for those whose racing days are past. The rider who's hung up his leathers for good will still willingly delve into his memory bank each June to offer advice to the current generation who come seeking it. Billy McCosh rode a matchless at the TT during the 60s. He was never a winner, but nobody strove harder for perfection. And the study he made of his own riding later helped hone the skills of one of the most successful riders of modern times, Yorkshireman Mick Grant, seven times a winner here. Now in retirement himself, Grant is passing on what he knows to newcomer Neil Robinson, who hails from Akosha's hometown of Ballymena in County Antrim. The wheel of knowledge has turned a complete revolution. I've never been really natural at learning circuits. I've always found it very hard work. Someone like Billy McCosh, I've learned more from Billy over the years. And I mean, it's not always that Billy's always right. It's that you've got someone there that's constructing what you talk about. I and mean, we've been around corners around here, and I thought, crikey, yeah, he's absolutely, he's dead on his right, and I've missed the obvious. And by the same token, we go to another set of corners, and Billy's totally wrong. Sarah's Cottage, in particular, is very important because it's followed by three or four right and left-hand corners, and you're, you're, you're climbing at the same time. So happened we were driving around one day and Mick explained this particular part of Sarah's cottage and I thought it was wrong. And motorcycle racing you talk about peeling off and so on. You peel off into a corner that you can't actually see. And I think what, what Mick was doing, he was waiting until he could see the corner, which by that time was too late. Now, unless you get that absolutely right and be absolutely on the right line, you probably lose a few seconds at the end of the straight. Once we talked about it and discussed it, he tried it. He said it put 10 men an hour on him. Mike and I have been fairly friendly the last few years, and he's just told me, you know, a far better line than, than the one that I had previous, because I was using up all the road, you know, trying to get around the turn as fast as I could, but, you know, it's, it's the sort of place that you don't have to use all the road, and he pointed that out to me, and whenever I seen it, I seen it was obvious that it was true. You couldn't, I couldn't sort of nursemate someone and take them out every bit of corner and show them exactly where to be everywhere. 
But I think once they've got the gist of the idea of how to do it, I mean, for example, I tried to stress to Neil that if he's in bother on a particular corner, don't bother looking at that corner for the bother. It's the, corner, the problem's three uh, corners further back. And although it sounds logical, it, it's, it's so obvious you don't spot it. And now he understands that, it's really up to him to go out and do it. But you need that basic knowledge first. It took me 10 years to find that out. I think it's really good, you know, people like that there getting involved and helping people around, you know, it's, it's fantastic, really. Because otherwise I'd be, I'd be fairly well lost. Four o'clock on a Wednesday morning, and Neil Robinson is preparing to put what he hopes he's learned into practice. Getting up with the birds is another tradition unique to the TT. The island's residents use the same roads to go about their daily business, so closures are arranged to cause a minimum of inconvenience. I don't mind getting up early in the morning, but uh, I've heard some other people complain about it, about it, but I think it's fine. Well, me being a newcomer, you know, I want to go out and learn, and I think it's not bad. It's exciting and all, and probably a bit jelly, but well, I find it as good. This is not to be one of his more productive sessions, however. The chain comes off his Suzuki on the first lap, and he's left stranded out on the circuit, watching his rivals go by. But Robinson's misfortune is as nothing compared with local rider Ian Ogden. At the top of the Kronkavadi Strait, he and another rider touch in an overtaking maneuver. There is no runoff area. There are no protective bales. It's just a most unfortunate accident. You cannot lay blame to anybody. The true facts will never really be known, but he died doing exactly what he wanted to do. It's a cliche. But it's perfectly true. He got much pleasure from racing, and nobody could deny the pleasure he got. He thoroughly enjoyed it. It's been his life since he was 16. If anybody could see his face when he'd been racing, then they'd appreciate just what sort of pleasure he really got from it. It's entirely up to him. He was old enough, he knew exactly what he was doing. He knew all the risks that were involved in what he was doing, and he was prepared to carry on. And as I said before, he got so much from it, nobody could deny anybody that. There will be one more death this week. A sidecar passenger is killed when his machine careers into this wall. Practice ends appropriately in the gloom of a Friday evening. For the opening race on Saturday, the Formula One World Championship round, Joey Dunlop has qualified second fastest. Neil Robinson has posted the 12th fastest time, the best of the newcomers, but is still a frightening fraction short of knowing his way around. I mistook one for one particular bend for another one, and one was down one gear, and then the other one's flat out, and I took the first one which was supposed to be down a gear, I took it flat out, and just in the middle of it, I realised it was supposed to be down a gear, so I knocked it down a gear and just got round it nicely, so man, it's not too bad. <laughs> what do you mean by getting round nicely? Well, I got round it, <laughs> I suppose, and I suppose that's the main thing. Otherwise, because it's a real fast place, you know, when you're flat out, you're doing, well, that was in the production bike, probably 150 mile an hour, and if it had, I went down then, it, yeah, I don't know what would have happened. Saturday morning. On the mountain, you couldn't judge a sheep trial, let alone a series of high-speed bends. Down in Douglas, preparations for racing go on. 
Earth conditions don't improve, a postponement is inevitable. It's business as usual in the scrutineer's tent. And in the other tent. It's the way you tell them. For some fans, just turning up as a military operation, this one, a man of enduring status, even without quo, is drawn by instinct to the rowdier side of island life. I'm used to noise, mate. No, great. Noise. If it's noisy, great. You know, keep it going. There wouldn't be many of the island's wealthier residents who would mix comfortably with the TT crowd, but John Coglan is one of them. Well, if the weather's, you know, going to improve, I'll probably go up to Craig Bar and watch the bikes from there uh, with some friends of mine from Brazil, um, Trevor Baines and some buddies, and we're all going to get up there and have a few drinks and something to eat and watch the bikes. sitting on the jury meeting at 2.20, and then they said they'd make another decision at 3.30, so I went round in the car with them, and uh, the mist has got worse on the mountain. There must be eight miles where visibility is down to 20 metres, and in my mind, there's no decision to be made. It's just uh, logical to stop the event, because uh, anybody crashes up there, you can't see anything. The helicopter can't land. So in safety point of view, it's got to be stopped. Mad Sunday. No racing to write about, so Barry Sheen is called on to rescue the front page. Actually, no one on the island needs reminding that the former world champion doesn't care for this place, but they're reminded just the same. You couldn't say there's a total disregard for safety here, with Saturday's race programme postponed and the rearranged schedule for Sunday in serious jeopardy for the same reason. Nobody even bothers to turn up. It looks that bad. And an early decision is made to delay proceedings for yet another day, so the real road races can get down to the serious business of the mad Sunday thrash. TT fan dies and three are injured in motorcycle accidents. There's an appeal. It can be a costly day out, though the Manx Constabulary do their best to keep life, limb, and motorcycle intact for as long as the odds allow. The atmosphere is electric, and I think the men enjoy that. Certainly at the end of the fortnight, um, I would say one is as glad to see them go as one was to see them come, purely and simply just because you're so tired. The men are told about a month in advance that um, all rest days will be cancelled. They know from one year to the next never to book a holiday for that fortnight. Um, we, we just could not cope without being at full strength. So they know 18 hours a day for the 14 days will be expected. from Switzerland, 
did a thousand miles to come here, but until now, seems we just done it for the rain. Just go from cafe to cafe, have a point here, have one there. That's it. I'm waiting for. Monday, a sense of purpose returns to the race paddock at last. Roger Marshall arrives as a passenger with his own story to tell about the vigilance of the Manx police. The other day I was uh, just cruising down Sylvie Strait. It was a nice day. I was off to see Roger Burnett, my teammate. Had the shades on, listening to the music, and uh, next thing there was a gun in front of me. Um, and he pulled me up, and I was doing 85 mile an hour in a 30. So. Uh, they took me to court yesterday and uh, fined me £85 and banned me for a month. But he will still be one of Joey Dunlop's major rivals today. The ban applies only on the open road. Yorkshireman Jeff Johnson, the fastest qualifier, will also bear consideration. But the current Formula One championship leader, Anders Andersson from Sweden, isn't as happy as he looks. He prefers the short circuits and on his first visit here, he's off the pace. One or two championship points are all he's hoping for now. Road conditions are still not ideal, but they're improving all the time. Klein leads the 100 strong field away. Bill Smith sets off in search of his 50th replica trophy on bike 77, but his old injuries make him pull up on the first lap. Dunlop leads after lap one, but he's not happy with the rear tyre. Andy McGladdery comes through in second place. Dunlop changes his rear tyre and refuels in just 26 seconds at the end of the second lap and is still alone in the lead. Jeff Johnson has made steady progress to take over the runner-up spot from the gladdery. Neil Robinson is building on his practice form and will be the first newcomer home. Roger Marshall is caught doing 30 in a 185 mile an hour zone. This time, the lapse is mechanical, an engine misfire. There's nothing to impede the relentless Dunlop, though, as he comes down to take his fourth successive TT win in the Formula One class. 
Johnson is more than a minute in arrears, although, to be fair, his is a more standard version of the Honda racing machine. Then comes McGladdery, the first privateer home. Klein has done better than last year. He's 10th, but Anderson can manage only 12th and loses his world championship lead to Dunlop. Robinson finishes just ahead of him. I just wish that I'd been proper tyres on. I think it would have went a lot better, but I was really pleased that I got round so fast because um, there's not many newcomers that's done it so fast, I don't think. The old master Dunlop is also quietly satisfied. It's just as well he doesn't know what lies ahead. Tuesday, and another Northern Ireland rider is outclassing the field in the Formula 2. This time it's Brian Reed. But two of his Irish rivals are not so fortunate. Gene McDonnell on bike 15 will lose his life here at Belaf Bridge in a horrifying crash tomorrow. While number 14, Robert Dunlop's accident, is only a lap away. 28, Ian Newton. Silverstone, it says on his leathers, for his Armstrong ride later to come. Number 21, Chris Faulkner, is behind him. All these are Grand Prix refugees, but no sign of number 14, Robert Dunlop, who should have been fourth on the road behind Laycock. He has not yet reached Balaf. Robert Dunlop has overdone it three miles down the road from Balaf. He's flown to hospital with internal injuries. His condition is critical. Brian Reed fulfills a career-long ambition in winning his first TT title. But this is a sport in which jubilation can never detach itself from despair for long. Reed knows that from experience, and a chilling reminder awaits him in his next race. Wednesday. Joey Dunlop has recovered from the immediate shock of his younger brother's injuries and is preparing to ride the junior TT. Robert is already mercifully off the critical list, so for Joey, it's back to business. His luck has definitely turned, though. He will crash himself in this race, remount, and then retire with a broken exhaust. In 1985, Brian Reed had badly broken a leg in his very first race after winning the World Formula 2 title. Today, he crashes again. And this time, it's a broken collarbone and wrist. Off. I'm sure you can hear it now, but there's no alarm about Brian Reed. But very definitely, the machine seized as he came down to here. And here now Worse is to follow right as Gene McDonnell approaches the notorious Balaf. But uh, it was always obvious that Paget has got the ability. He just needs the relay a bit. Oh my God, fathers! Oh dear, this is a very serious accident here. Very serious accident here. I'll return you to the Rothmans comedy box at the grandstand. The helicopter taking Reed to hospital has startled a pony, which bolts right into McDonald's path. The rider is killed instantly. It's a bitter paradox that this tragedy should be the springboard for yet another Ulsterman to win a TT title this week. Looks very much like him. It's Steve Cole, and the Irish dominance of the TT continues. Well, we say that, uh, but we still have... Thursday is the only rest day of the week, a day for reflection, discussion, argument, with safety, as always, among the favoured topics. We've got to obviously look at all the protection as much as we can, but you can't talk about the fact that it's a road race, and I don't think you can change it. Um, as long as the drivers like to come here and they share in record numbers, um, I think we must take that into consideration. The thing that could well stop the TT is if the drivers didn't want to race here. But this year we've got nearly a thousand entries. So I love the Le Mans especially, and to come here to win, that's been my ambition. And I've won a world championship, and that was my ambition as well. So this week has really fulfilled them all, really. I suppose sometimes you think it's a bit dangerous and fed up getting hurt sometimes, but. There's nothing else really left for me to do. I have to keep on doing what I'm good at. Some people can live without the element of risk and other people feel they need it. It's up to the people organising it to make the racing as safe as it possibly can. It's far better to be done as it is done in a controlled environment as we try to do than to go charging like idiots along public roads. They're not involving other people in what they're doing. 
They know the risks, they take the risks. And we try to control that as much as we possibly can to minimise them. I've always been critical of the ACU and the way they've run it. The marshalling's good, but we need more marshals to make it safer. You can put a few more straw bales round, but quite honestly, they don't want to just make the thing look good. I mean, I think the way it can be made safer is to up the, the qualifying. You know, there's too many people going around at the minute that really shouldn't be in the TT. They haven't got either the speed or the ability to do it. And at a time when we're getting record entries, surely this is a time that can be more selective on the riders that take in. They've got to have an international licence to race here. They've got to qualify, qualify for the international licence. And if you, say, put up the practice times to ensure they get higher qualifying time, you then make the practising more dangerous. I think um, you must accept that anybody who's qualified for an international licence is really qualified to race here. The attitude towards change that has prevailed for the last 80 years is not easily eroded. Even the new grandstand, the most significant development this year, has been built largely in reaction to the Bradford football disaster. The wooden standard replacers have been in service for 60 years. The official opening in the presence of His Royal Highness the Duke of Kent takes place just before the last race of the week, Friday's senior TT. Naturally, the men and machines of yesteryear are not forgotten, and Friday is their day too. The classic parade is not a race, but it's hard to keep old habits in check. The senior TT which follows dates back to 1911 and is, by tradition, the premier race of the week. But it won't be fondly remembered by our men. A broken damper bolt delays Dunlop for two minutes and leaves him back in fourth place at the finish. While repairs are effected, Neil Robinson disappears altogether. There's also another fatal accident. In all, four riders are killed this fortnight. One of the blackest records in the TT's checkered history. I feel the worst week ever I had, really, at the TT. But uh, not too bad, you know. I had that good a year last year. I had to have a bad year short, and I think that's what I, you know, I've, I've won the Formula One right now, which is a good thing. So I fell off, and everything has happened. And, and, I'm glad now it's all over. Come back next year for a new, a new start. Then the gear lever off. You didn't wake on the ground or anything? No, I just broke changing gear. Today, it's sort of disappointed me a bit with not getting finished. It would have been nice just to have two finishes, but it hasn't been bad, you know, overall. Is it your favourite course already? Uh, not one of my favourite, no, but uh, I'm getting to like it more every, every lap of day. Uh, you know, the more you get to know the place, the better it gets. Neil Robinson won't be back this year. A road racing accident claimed his life three months after his first TT experience. Robert Dunlop will be back. His bizarre worship of the sport that nearly killed him is the sort of spirit that will keep the TT going long beyond its 80th anniversary. There is a lot of suffering, hardship, and uh, financial problems, but uh, when you want a race, it all seems worthwhile. I would never give up the TT uh, or road racing. Uh, I just love the sport, and it's very hard to kick. The excitement, the the thrills, and the and the spells—that's the excitement, isn't it? <laughs>